Welcome to this How Data Breaches Land at the Accountant's Door webinar. I'm going to welcome today's moderator into the conversation. Welcome, Brendan. Welcome to, the, to today's webinar, How Data Breaches Land at the Accountant's Door, sponsored by EFT Shore. My name is Brendan Clifford, and I'm the Head of Infrastructure and Security at CPA Australia. I'll be today be your moderator for today's sponsored webinar. Today you will be hearing from Michael Galanos, Business Development Manager at EFT Shaw, and Gavin Leveson, Chief Growth Officer at EFT Shaw. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners from around Australia and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be joining us today. It's now my pleasure to invite your presenters, Michael Galanos and Gavin Leveson to the screen. Welcome, Michael and Gavin. Over to you, Gavin. Thank you, Brendan. Um, so today we're gonna to cover a lot of ground quickly and I'll, I'll keep it interesting. Um, and keep it moving. Uh, and over the next uh, 45 minutes, really what I'll be talking about is, uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of a playback and, and talk about um, the scams and frauds that are most prevalent, uh, the fastest growing, and which you uh, may be aware of and, and, and may have actually come across uh, your business, um, hopefully a miss, not, not, a, not a, a successful scam. Um, and I have spoken about some of those things before, and some of you might have heard that. Um, but I think they have a lot of nuances. Um, they're constantly evolving, um, and so I'm going to cover those. Then I'm going to talk about how this recent spate of data breaches relates to those um, scams and frauds. And I think it's often seen that the data breaches are the province of your colleagues in IT and technology, while, you know, protecting cash is your responsibility, but there's a strong relationship between those two things. And these um, national um, and quite alarming data breaches can very quickly become you and your business's problem. And I'd like to build that bridge. Then I'm gonna talk briefly and generally about a response framework uh, to think about how you protect your business um, and, and think about your response uh, to these rising risks before handing over to the to Michael just for the last few minutes to just touch on where F EFT show or F show as we call it fits in. Um, we're certainly not here to to shove our product and our solution down your throat, uh, but it is relevant in terms of the response framework, certainly conceptually. So with that said, let's dive in uh, to the first section, which is really looking back at these scams and frauds, which you, uh, you know, if you attend financial conferences and webinars, you, you might have heard me talk about these before, um, but I'm gonna really recontextualize them and in the context of the data breaches. So I'm sure you've seen lots of um, slides like this from various presenters or on blogs or out in the media, and really there is rampant growth in frauds and scams. There's, there's no two ways about it. Um, 277 million was lost uh, to just payment redirection scams generally in Australia in 2021. More recently, the ACCC has said 242 million was lost to businesses alone in payment redirection scams in 2022. And then in, in the footnotes of their latest targeting scams report released just a few weeks ago, they say only 13% of these scams are reported. So. If you, if you consider that, then the real cost to business in Australia last year was seven times 242 million. We're talking about a, a, a problem in the high one to two billions. Uh, it's, it's significant. The average amount lost just to business email compromise in 2022 was $64,000. If you're a large business, well, perhaps you can wear that. But if you're a smaller business, that can be devastating. And what I'll also add is, $64,000 is just the average money's lost, but I would argue that at least 3X or 5X is the economic impact to the business when you consider legal costs, forensic costs, system downtime, any HR impact, and most importantly, reputational, banner, uh, reputational damage. But I think the stats, if the stats become numbing, the headlines don't. Um, you know, we, we could change these headlines almost on a weekly basis in terms of scams and frauds. 
Um, they really somewhere someone is getting done uh, by cyber fraudsters, individuals certainly, but businesses too. And underneath these numbers, underneath the statistics, underneath the headlines, tends to be three prominent, popular varietals, basically, of scams. The one is a supplier email compromise. Um, the other one is a executive fraud, um, which is, um, you know, a variation on a supplier email compromise. And the third one is an insider scam. Underneath all of those scams is very much a um, failure of either password hygiene or, or some sort of internal financial control. But regardless of what the failure is or what the scam is, ultimately fraudsters are trying various ways to get you to believe that someone you're paying sits at their, the fraudsters' bank details. They change bank details. Um, the wrong payment is made, money is lost, and recovery is very difficult. Now, historically, recovery was difficult because fundamentally the banks, and this is the case today, do not carry liability. If you click authorize, approve, um, the, the, you have taken over liability. In the UK, they call it authorized push payment fraud for that reason. However, more recently, the difficulty in recovering through the banks is best summarized by Angus Sullivan from CBA, who, who just a few months ago said, it's not just about liability. I mean, not that he would say that, but it's, it's more that the fraudsters know the approaches and the methods the banks are using to try to detect fraud so they can navigate around it. And then he also mentions cryptocurrency, which is anonymous, hard to track. Um, which has obviously been an accelerant uh, for, for the fraudsters holding on to the money they illicitly get. So with that in mind, let me, let me step through a supply email compromise because many of you should be familiar with this. I'm going to go very quickly um, to, to summarize this. So if a fraudster wanted to get money out of, let's say, this notional business, AutoWorks, um, the first step they'd do is probably some basic research on AutoWorks' relationships to its suppliers. They'd send out phishing emails to those suppliers. Um, the suppliers then, you know, they're trying to get a click from, from the suppliers and they just want one click once. Here's an example of some phishing emails. These are actually, you know, a little, you know, they're more advanced versions than this. These are almost a little juvenile. They're getting far more sophisticated, but nevertheless, they use brands we know and trust like Microsoft or Dropbox. Um, here's an interesting variation. So this looks like an email with a PDF attachment, but that is actually not a PDF attachment. It's actually, if you click on there, it inserts some malware into your system. So those are just examples of phishing emails. But nevertheless, the fraudsters are trying to get a click. They will send it out. They, they could send it out to every single one of AutoWorks' trading partners. And some people's spam filters might pick up a phishing email. Some people might be a bit more savvy. But let's say Dave, financial controller at Tyco or accounts receivable at Tyco, maybe he's lapsed in judgment or his filters aren't set up correctly and he, he clicks. And when he clicks, in the old way, he'd be taken to a phishing site. In the new way, just that click, as I mentioned, would insert some malware on his system. But let's say he clicks, he gets taken to a phishing site, he fills in his details, looks very authoritative. And when he does that, he hands his details to the fraudster. Very important to note that even if those aren't the details to his email system, if there are similar passwords, the fraudsters can very quickly extrapolate from one set of passwords to another, which is why you really want to use completely different passwords for each and every app. Not similar, completely different. In this example, the fraudsters in to Dave's email, and now he can either is issue an email message to Dave's customer AutoWorks, saying they've changed their bank account details. Sometimes he might manipulate some documents, the fraudster, he or she, manipulate some documents. But nevertheless, a change of bank details is communicated from tire code to AutoWorks. Very important to note, it is sent from Dave's legitimate email address, from his email account. The fraudsters weaponize legitimate emails of the relevant person. They don't use sort of a proxy or slightly different emails. Now let's say, uh, AutoWorks have got their AP team doing callback controls or verbal, you know, verbal checks on vendors, which many people do. The fraudsters know that. So one way the fraudsters get around it is a phone call ahead. They phone ahead and they say, hey, uh, this is Dave from Tyco or this is the accounts receivable team at Tyco. We have indeed changed our bank details. You will shortly receive an email to that effect. The other thing they can do is port phone numbers. So if AutoWorks do phone, 
um, you know, it goes through to the fraudster. They can also manipulate the contact details on, on emails and documents because they know people often rely on those. Um, nevertheless, let's say AutoWorks aren't sure and they mail Dave back, confirming something. Dave never gets the email because the first thing the fraudsters do is put filters in. They double down um, on the change details and AutoWorks pay the fraudster. Now, that is a classic business email compromise. There's a variation on it called an executive fraud where the fraudster impersonates not a trading partner or a supplier, but actually an executive within the organization. So let's step through an example like that very quickly. So let's say I'll start at a slightly different place. The cyber criminal syndicate, either they can research a company and target one person, or they can just send out mass phishing emails and see who clicks because they just need one click, right? Just one click once. And let's say it's Dave or Sally to, to be gender neutral, and they click on one of these phishing emails, they pass their, their details to the fraudster, and now what the fraudster can do is just observe emails. They're very patient fraudsters. They'll research days, weeks, months if necessary. They do longer scams, and then they'll locate this person inside the organization. They'll map out the organization, and then they'll wait the opportune time. And then they will impersonate someone of authority in the organization and instruct a more junior person to make a payment. And again, they'll use the legitimate emails um, to do that. The person pays. Um, and we see a lot of the especially in larger companies in Australia. And the payment goes to the wrong person. It's just rather than impersonating a supplier, an uh, uh, individual is impersonated. As I mentioned earlier, that's the average amount lost to BC in 2022, which is up almost a third from 2021, but that's not the main cause. You know, that's not the economic impact. The economic impact is at least three times. I think I'm being prudent when I say three times. The examples where it's five times, 10 times. And just to illustrate this, I'm gonna step through a very interesting example for three reasons. One, these are often not made public and well-documented, this one was. Secondly, it led to significant reputational damage to underline my previous point. And thirdly, it's a combination between a supplier email compromise and an executive impersonation. Both the scams I've just um, sort of stepped through or articulated. Um, and quite fascinating. So let's introduce the players. Uh, on the victim end or the target company end was Levitas Capital, a fast-growing hedge fund in Sydney. And the fraudster had understood, clearly targeted or spearfished, or is a, 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 a term used, very targeted understanding and research of Levitas Capital as a fund, as an investment fund, and its relationship around authority and administration to its, its, its trustees, AET Corporate Trust and Apex Administrators. Okay, so that's on the one hand. On the protagonist or antagonist end, on the other hand, you've got fraudsters, um, and they set up companies purely for the purpose of committing a fraud. Unique Star Trading, Pavlin Limited, and a third one, which I'll introduce later, East Grand Trading out of Singapore. So let's step through the scam. The first step is a malicious email, as per the examples I've, I've given before. And they send an email, it's early days of COVID. This happened in late 2020, early 2021. I'm open to correction. Sorry, late 2021, I think. And um, they send what has discovered to be a malicious Zoom invite. And this is early days of COVID. We're all getting tons of video conferencing invites. And the principal at Levitas Capital clicks on this invite. It could have looked like this, you know, um, but it's, it looks real. It comes from, you know, a legitimate source in the eyes of, 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 of the principal. And Michael Fagan, the principal, clicks and it is believed inserts malware into his computer system, certainly into his email at least. And the fraudster can now monitor Michael's email in and out. He can weaponize it and take control of it. Okay, so that was step one. Step two, the fraudster uses this company they've set up for the purposes of fraud, Unique Star Trading, and they don't issue a manipulated invoice. They realize that this Levitas, their target, is an investment fund. They understand Levitas invests in investee companies. So what they do is they issue, they create what looks like a capital call document from Unique Star Trading. They don't send it to Levitas. Rather, they send it to either the administrators or AT Corporate Trust. It's not entirely clear from the reporting which of the two, but let's assume it's the corporate trustees. Sends it to AT Corporate Trust. At this point, I'm going to flag that, you know, here's already a failure of con internal controls because how did Unique Star Trading get into the vendor master file of the trustee? That, that's not clear from 
you know, what's been reported about the scam. But nevertheless, they get in and they issue this capital call document. AET Corporate Trust do the right thing. They call Fagan for authorization, but Fagan's a gym. So he doesn't get it. So instead, AET Corporate Trust email him. Apparently, he sees the email and emails back. But as I said in the previous example, the first thing the fraudsters do after the malicious Zoom invite is they insert filters. They've always been in control of his email account. He can't see they're in control. And they respond as him. They block his response and they respond as him authorizing the payment. And $1.2 million is actually paid to Unique Star Trading. Immediately, that money is withdrawn from a Sydney ANZ branch, moved to several ANZ branches in Queenstown. A local mule um, who's part of the syndicate travels to Queenstown, withdraws the money in various lots of cash, and actually takes about $780,000 out of the country on a plane somehow. Believe it or not, two more payments are made in that same modality using the similar scam. 2.5 million is paid again to Pavlin Limited, and a few days later, another 2.5 million. So now we're at a total of 7.8 million is paid to East Grand Trading in Singapore. Eventually, they figure out what's going on, whether it's the trustees or Levitas themselves. They stop these last two payments, but they never stop that initial 780 grand, which they never recover. And here's the reputational bomb. Australian Catholic Super about to make a $16 million investment in the fund, pull their funding. I'm sure it ricocheted through other investors. That, that's not confirmed, but I imagine it did. And it leads to basically the collapse of the fund. And really what all these examples are doing is illustrating something we talk about passionately and frequently at EFT Show. It's not about you and your system anymore. And it's not even about the behavior and sort of compliance management of your staff, although both of those things are critical. It's just that those things alone can't necessarily keep you safe in this digitally connected world where a failure in your trading partner or suppliers controls or cybersecurity or a combination of those things renders you vulnerable. So a failure in your ecosystem of trading partners can render you vulnerable. And what adds to the vulnerability, there are several things, but I'm going to start with two. The, the first thing is the fraudsters need a channel. And unfortunately, the channel is often email and it might transition to chat or messenger services like Slack. But for today, email is the de facto channel and language of business, talking to other business. And email systems are notoriously vulnerable. Um, in the words of Michael Connery, he's really a le leading luminary in the Australian cybersecurity industry from security in depth in Melbourne. And Michael does work for some of the biggest companies in Australia, biggest organization, certainly government. He says, and he's been saying this for some time, 90% of all attacks start with or include email. And then the other thing is the fraudsters need a goal. And I, I've touched on this over the previous sort of 15 minutes that they just need a click. You've, there's an awful asymmetry to, to protecting your business is, and that asymmetry is, you can't get it wrong once. They just need one click. And yet they'll keep trying to attack, whether it's cyber attacks or, or scams and frauds or phishing emails. It's constant, especially on a bigger company. So, you know, Brad Smith said it best. Maybe you're chuckling to yourself. Every company has at least one employee who will click on anything. But he, he his maxim does not go far enough. Every company has at least one employee who will click on anything once. Often one click is enough. And that's still not far enough because it's not that. It's that every company has at least one supplier with an employee who will click on anything once. And that really sets the steam for how challenging it is to keep yourself safe in this environment. So just to close off this section, why is payment fraud growing? Why are these scams so prevalent? These have been my themes. It's easy to steal identity. Email systems are vulnerable. Yes, while there's some light progress around banks doing verifications, Fundamentally, they don't match, and if they did match, they can't match in a way that works for business. Um, so the banking system doesn't quite match account names to account numbers effectively. Your ERP system, great for workflow, will improve your controls, but fundamentally self-referential, checking new documents against existing, can't check against an independent third source. Work from home and hybrid workplaces not help this, this problem because if your team's distributed, then it weakens financial and IT controls. And lastly, 
most accounts teams response to this or finance teams is callback controls and more manual control and people can help but they've got to be perfect and how are you perfect at high volume and high velocity um so that's scams and frauds now over the recent time we've seen some new headlines and you'll know these well unfortunately which was we had the massive optus breach in late september of last year that was shortly followed by the Medibank breach. And this year, the trend continued with Latitude Financial, massive amounts of consumer identification data lost, um, 11 million records, up to 7 million records Medibank, up to 8 million Latitude Financial records. These are huge numbers. Um, and it got us thinking at FCHR, like, what does that mean for scams and frauds? The IT tech team know what it means for them. They've got to jack up their perimeter defense, but what does it mean for us in finance and accounts? And there's definitely a relationship. And what I'm gonna do over the next part of this talk, before talking about response and then handing over to Michael, just briefly to touch on EFTA, is build a bridge for you from data breaches and what that might mean for scams and frauds. The crazy thing is, and what, you know, we've got a thesis at EFTA, which in effect I'll be talking through, but. Optus and Medibank were only two of this many data breaches last year in which private consumer information was lost. In fact, that's not an exhaustive list. Apparently, 853 data breaches were reported to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner under their mandatory scheme, which demands that companies report a breach in the case of certain privacy things being breached. Now, that is a huge number and apparently, and I, I stress apparently because I, I've heard or read online that Australia last year experienced 20 times the global av national average of data breaches, of business data breaches. Now, that's an uncorroborated figure, but let's say it's high um, and we are over indexing. Um, reasons why? Global illicit trade in data because data has value, um, data makes the business world turn and makes most of society turn now. Companies are capturing large amounts of it. So there is a trade in it. Secondly, global volatility. And we seem to lurch from one crisis to the next, from pandemic to war in Europe to, um, you know, a next round of re quasi recession. You know, when volatility goes up, it's well documented that cybercrime goes up and all crime goes up. And then Australia has some unique, let's say, features. We're an affluent country. We're a highly structured economy, which frauds does like because then they know the response pathways, of both our authorities and our institutions and our banks and our organizations to try remedy breaches. And lastly, uh, I think trust is an important part of society and the economy in Australia, and that is a great and fantastic thing, but then it can be weaponized. It also makes us vulnerable if we're trusting. To put a lighter note on it, um, cyber crime is, is a frustratingly safe form of crime, and here you have some mafia bosses saying, for health and safety reasons, we'll be transitioning to cyber crime. Now, to build that bridge from these data breaches to the scams and frauds, which often we're as financial leaders charged with protecting the business from, I'm going to step through the Optus hack because it was well reported and documented. But I want to stress this. I in no way want to blame Optus for anything because I think that's victim blaming. They were the victim of a crime. It's very difficult to be perfect in protecting your organization. They won't be the last. And yes, I understand the ire and the frustration directed towards them because a huge amount of data was lost, our data, individual data. But they were the, also the victim of, a, of an attack and a breach. So let's step through that. Uh, 17th of September, a hack-up goes onto the dark web and posts this message. Um, and it's a, it's a teaser. And the hacker says, I've got 1.1 million Optus mobile numbers. Anyone taking, you know, anyone interested? Then a week later, the hacker goes back onto the dark web. And these are the legitimate posts. I've had that corroborated. Um, by a substantial source and posts these notes and goes back and says, hang on, I don't have 1.1 million records. I've got 11 million records. I've got 11.2 million user records. And then of that, I've got 10 million addresses. If you want the user data, you're going to pay me $150,000. If you want the address data, sorry, the address data, you're going to pay me 200,000. 
if you buy both together, I'll give you a bulk discount, $300,000, okay? Um, and that's non-exclusive use. So it could resell to multiple groups. But, and then says to Optus, if you want it back exclusively, you're going to pay me a million dollars, okay? And they want to be paid in a cryptocurrency Monero, right? So our first question at FCHA was who would spend that kind of money? And as we've often said, it's not more hackers. The hackers take the data, but they don't use the data. They sell the data to other groups, which are cyber criminal groups. And these groups, and we've spoken about this before, these groups are organized, they're commercial, they often have shareholders, KPIs. We've heard of cyber criminal groups having employee benefits. They're intentional and they use all the same technology you use, they use but for different purposes. In fact, this article recently came across my desk, which was uh, covering a Kaspersky, the cybersecurity company's research into the job market on the dark web. And just to lift two interesting things from that um, article or that study by Kaspersky, if you look on the left, you'll see the organizational structure for one of these cyber criminal groups. And it looks alarmingly like a development marketing team or whatever structure, development team structure you would have in your company. You might not have a reverse engineer and an attacker, but you'll have an analyst, a developer, a tester, an IT admin. And then on the right, you can see they track the volume of ads and job searches in over 36 months from early 2020. And that big jump in the first bar in the chart is when COVID hit, which underlines my previous point, which is um, in times of volatility, crime goes up. So that's who would buy the data. What do they do with it? What do they do with it? Why do they buy it and what do they do with it? So let's try to answer that question. They had 11.2 million records in the database if they bought the non-exclusive data for $300,000. They had a lot of information in that. Now, to try to understand what they do with it, I'm just going to take one record, okay? And here's my far more handsome and uh, has a head of hair and like me, um, head of marketing, Nick Decker. And like many of you, Nick will live a digital life, both privately and, and in his commercial business role, interacting with businesses. And as he interacts with his businesses, they'll collect information from him. <clears throat> in their databases, whether it's Netflix or HubSpot or Dropbox or Microsoft, they'll have a unique identifier with him, which is anonymous, but it'll be linked behind a firewall to other identifying information, whether it's name, address, login, email. The problem is, if you bought those 11.2 million Optus records, you've got a lot of that information and you can already start connecting it up. So the fact that you didn't get passwords from Optus, that's of no concern to a cyber criminal group. The other thing is from this information, you can get more information and you can really build profiles on people. So let's just Let's just unpack that. If you've just got Nick's name and address, look what you can do. If you've got Nick's name, well, we've all done this. And click go on LinkedIn and you work out who Nick works for, who he works with, and so on. So now you know Nick's role, occupation, employer. Let's take address. Address is an interesting one. If you take Nick's address and you go onto a property website, just type that in, you can see very quickly that Nick rented this apartment in Manly, in Sydney, you can see what a, you know the apartment's value. You could very quickly extrapolate a bit about Nick's income. <clears throat> if you went onto Facebook, you could work out he, 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 he rented it with his partner, so then you could fill the bigger picture. But the killer thing here is you've got context for something, like a scam, because you now know Nick is renting it on a weekly basis from a company called Stone Real Estate Manly, okay? So just with those few clicks, I could put together a scam, okay? And here's what my scam might look like. Hi, Nick. Quick one. It's Linda from Stone Real Estate Manly. Tried calling you regarding your rent. We've got two phone numbers on file. Click and tell me which, click into our portal and tell me which is the right one. And those three things I've circled are the variables. They're the variables. Because you could now build segments. If you've got 11.2 million records, you could build a segment of people could be 20 people, 50 people, 100 people. And that segment might be called professionals who rented an apartment from Stone Real Estate in Manly, Sydney. But then you could build another segment called bought house through Ray White. Or in the business sense, you could build a segment called HR leaders who have recently changed their jobs. Now, you've got 11.2 million records to work with. That is a huge amount. 
But how can a cyber criminal organization sit and go through all 11.2 million records, clicking and building profiles on the web? That The way I just did it would take thousands, if not tens of thousands of hours, if not longer. But you don't need to because you can build some code. You can get a piece of code made out of a program language called Python, and that'll scrape the web for details for these cyber criminal organizations. How hard is that to do? $15 on outsource website Fiverr, which is like um, a website which started out to outsource design for various tasks, um, but now has become for coding as well. But even doing that, that's a bit 2021. Today, you could go to one of these powerful chatbots. The most you know famous one at the moment is obviously ChatGPT. And what you can see on your screen is me just going into ChatGPT, which is a language AI fundamentally, and coding is also a language. So I just asked ChatGPT to write me a Python script that will scrape the internet for details. And here you can see how quickly ChatGPT does it. I'm not a coder. So if you put this in the hands of someone more technological, well, they can do real damage. So here's our thesis. What am I getting at? And I, I think you would have concluded this, that all those scams and frauds are about impersonation. All these data breaches equip fraudsters who are not just going to buy one set of data like the Optus data. They're going to buy Optus data. They're going to buy the Medibank data. They've got 853 sets of data breaches which might have found themselves onto the web, and they're going to build profiles. And that makes them better at scamming, much better at scamming. And so our thesis is, the uptick in data breaches is going to re lead to a massive volumetric increase in scams and frauds. Now, that's not just, you know, self-serving from FCHA's point of view. Catriona Lowe, the ACCC deputy chair, said as much. She mentioned that in the weeks following the data breaches, these two I've mentioned, there was a big tick in, uptick in, in, in reports to ScamWatch. But my response is, you ain't seen nothing yet. And my logic for that is, fraudsters know everyone's on alert when these big data breaches hit the press. Everyone's more alert. What we think they'll do is sit with the data, enrich it carefully, build out these segments, monitor activity, and then over time um, execute these scams and frauds. Now, what, what should you do about it? Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about a response framework in big brush terms, and then I'm going to hand over to Michael, just talk briefly about where FTR fits in. Um, so the response framework. Now, we base our thinking on a lot of the thinking done or sort of an argument put forward by Nigel Fair. Nigel Fair was the ex-lead uh, investigator in the High Tech Crimes Unit of the Australian Federal Police, and he's the chair for UNSW in Canberra and the Cybersecurity Department, and, and, and really a great authority figure on um, sort of cybersecurity and financial control framework. And Nigel talks about having a cyber crime strategy as distinct from a cyber security strategy. And what he means by cyber crime, it sounds like a semantic difference, but it's, it's, it's not. It's about bringing financial controls together with cyber security controls, thinking of them as a collective or for financial leaders to get much closer to technology leaders. And if you take that thinking and we combine it with our own, we would argue there are five elements to make up that joint conjoined strategy called cyber crime strategy. There is technology, training, culture, enhancing internal controls and pressure testing. I'll talk briefly about these. Training. Um, to stop scams, you need to know what to look for. To limit the chances of data breaches incursions, you need good password hygiene. How do you get to those things? You train people. If you're in a small organization, there's lots of free resources online, lots, videos, content, articles. You can sign up for free newsletters. They help. If you're a large organization with more budget at your disposal, bring in companies to train you. There are many, and it helps. What we've learned about training is old-style compliance training, which is four hours and doesn't work. Smaller sessions, keep them fun, frequent, one concept a session. That's how you train people on this stuff. Culture is really important. You can train people all you want. You can have all the technology and controls you want. But if the culture isn't there, you're increasing your vulnerability. And what do you need to be there around culture? You need what we call a high shame threshold. What does that mean? If 
people, if it takes a lot for someone to feel embarrassed in your organization, that is a good thing. If embarrassment is common and has a low bar, that's a bad thing. Why? Your colleagues and yourself need to be able to put up your hand really quickly and go, I've clicked on the wrong thing, or I've pressed the wrong button, or should I click on this without fear of embarrassment? Because these scams are like wildfires, these cyber breaches, they're all like wildfires. If, the, if it's just a little ember burning on one blade of bush, you can possibly stop it. If the whole forest is alight, it is very difficult to stop. And what makes what's the difference between those two things? The speed of response. And that's about a culture where people very quickly can put up their hand and go to someone else or senior and go, I've done the wrong thing. Internal controls. Uh, this audience does not need to you know, me to tell you about good internal controls. Um, we all know about segregation of duties. Um, I will touch on vendor callback controls. That is what everyone's main line of defense is against rent these scams and frauds, but they've got to be done carefully and perfectly. And you don't want to fall into a whole lot of potholes that we see people do around how they do their callback controls. We don't have time today to unpack that. Um, can either handle in the Q&A or we can chat to you separately about that. And then one thing I will flag is staff entry and exit, especially staff exit, often poorly handled and increases your risk factor. Pressure testing, penultimate one, pressure testing in the cybersecurity world. Um, it is common to pressure test your, I beg your pardon, it's, it's common to pressure test your perimeter defenses, your technology. Um, around cyber attack, why don't we do the same thing around scams and frauds in the finance team? Simulate um, scenarios to see if you can get, if you can spot gaps in your controls. Create false authority, create a false supplier, change an invoice, and test your team. It's, it's for the betterment of the organization, and those are just a few ways to pressure test um, scams and frauds. And lastly, technology. Um, it's become good manners for technology vendors or solution providers to not speak technology because it's self-serving. But I want to say this, as the world gets complex, more complex and changes, you do probably need to change and arguably expand a little bit your suite of technology. And I'm going to use the marketing example. Um, five years ago at FCHR, we probably had one marketing tool, which was a CRM system called HubSpot. Today we have seven because we do things with more granularity, care, and specificity. So we've got a meeting booking application. We've got an analysis tool. We've got other analytics attribution tools. It's just normal. The same is true probably, and certainly should be through around cybersecurity, and certainly bringing financial controls into a more digital age. You don't need everything, but you might need a little more than you have. Um, and that brings me to the last section of our talk, which is... Um, you know, where FCHR fits in, and FCHR fits in around um, the technology bucket. Um, and what we like to say, or how I like to think about FCHR is, um, if your cyber team is about locking the front door to your business so that breaches can't come in, what we like to do um, is lock the back door so that no money can get out. And in doing that, we uh, say we're bringing your financial controls into the digital age. And Michael's just going to take a few minutes to explain how we do that. Um, so thank you for listening. I'm going to hand over control to Michael, um, and he will um, take you through the next bit. Over to you, Mike. Perfect. Thank you, Gavin. Oh, what a you know amazing introduction there, I guess, into the you know risk landscape that we are seeing currently as far as the cyber environment with scams and fraud is concerned. So what I'll touch on really quickly is just an overview of exactly what we're doing here at EFT Shore, where us and our customers and clients have had a lot of success in protecting their organizations against these types of scams. Now, we're working with organizations, really any shape or size you can imagine across all industries around Australia, but the key point with having a large and diverse customer base is through those customers, we've been able to actually build a shared database of supplier information. And we found as we verify supplier accounts on behalf of those customers, it's very common that we have suppliers who are being paid by multiple customers that are using EFT Shore. And that also allows us to build a strength in numbers where we see a cross match occur and organizations don't have to just rely on their own independent manual controls, but they can actually have that power of the people and the strength in that crowd. 
Now with our solution, we really identified four major points in the AP process where most of these frauds do occur through a lot of those examples that Gavin covered earlier. And we found ways through this database in our solution to provide that automation and protection for your team to firstly minimize that ma manual work, but really improve that security. So as a quick overview, if I actually run from the back of the process to the beginning, we start in your online banking environment when you're actually making a payment to a supplier. I mean, a lot of finance leaders I speak to at this point in their process really don't know what's on the screen and whether it's correct or not. You're really just relying on what's gone on earlier in your control process. And as we mentioned, there's a lot of ways that can go wrong. So at EFT, sure, we are providing an automated checking tool, which allows you to immediately identify if the firstly BSB and account number belong to the vendor whose name you've entered through our thumb alerts in the middle. But also we're checking live things like the GST status, the ABN validity. We can also flag duplicate payments as well, also out of range of payments too. So these payments, these payment alerts can be given to you live in that online banking environment. But we do also find a lot of times the AP team is doing that review a lot earlier on when they're actually preparing a payment file. Teams are spending hours and hours checking payments to invoices that the invoice may be fraudulent or they might be not checking all of the invoices or all the payment lines. So there's still a lot of holes in that process. So we've simplified and automated that process as well, giving you those exact same alerts in our online portal where it's as simple as just uploading a payment file before it goes into the bank and you can straight away see if all of those payment details are valid. So it's all well and good too that it is important on the way out to know exactly where your funds are going. You need to be checking each payment run individually because sometimes what's in your system doesn't always make it into the bank. There's manipulation in that path as well. But we do also protect you on that front end as far as the information in your ERP is concerned. I mean, that's the source of truth. Very important place where that information is stored. It needs to be true and valid. So we start by taking a look through your current vendor data where we do a full cleanse and audit utilizing that database I mentioned as well as public registries, other sources of information to firstly identify any issues or anomalies that exist with what might currently be sitting in your ERP system. So by cleaning up that data, we minimize that risk up front, meaning going forward, you and your team only need to focus on the new information that comes into your system through a new supply being onboarded or a change of details. We can allow you to create digital onboarding forms, which will then be sent out to your suppliers to complete online, where they start by, for example, entering their ABN before being verified by EFT Shore. Now we have three different verification methods, which we find in of itself provides added security through that diversity of different ways to verify a bank account. But also our methods have a few other security layers. For example, our cross match, our most tried and true method that we use in most instances, if a supplier is already in our database, has already been getting paid by multiple EFT Shore customers, we can cross match what they provided you to attest yes, that this agrees to what other organizations are paying, meaning you too can have that strength in numbers. But we also find we have the ability through a direct bank link to verify suppliers' banking information directly through their bank through a, a unique encrypted online portal. So that allows us to do that bank to EFT Shore transfer of data allowing us to have that information from the source in the most secure way possible. We do also have our own independent phone call team. So we have a team of verification specialists on shore in Sydney, and they do measures like tracking the IP address of suppliers, ensuring that they aren't using a VPN. We even check when web domains are registered to make sure it's not a spoof impersonating a supplier. And most importantly, of course, using independently sourced phone numbers basically to ensure all the details that we verify in a test are correct and they are going to the intended recipient, not a fraudster who's located somewhere else impersonating a supplier, for example. And a key part of this process too is we even automate the data entry of the verified details going into your system because we can find even if your team does all the right steps and controls when they do the checking and verifying of the account, sometimes someone might do a typo or enter the details incorrectly or it gets passed to someone else who might enter an incorrect detail. So we automate that process as well for you. So really with our solution, it is all about providing that end-to-end -end protection 
because we find that in this control process, a deficiency in controls at any point in that AP process can lead to you ultimately paying the wrong account, which is why it is important, as you can imagine, to have that protection from the beginning of the process all the way to the end. And we have you know, proven over the last few years that we have prevented some major frauds on behalf of our customers through the solution. So it really goes to show there is that benefit when you do provide that automation to your controls and really bring that technology to ensure you are always protected at all points beyond any capability that you'd be able to do so you know, manually just relying on humans. So, I mean, that's that's my very you know quick run through and over and what we do here at EFT Shore, as Gavin mentioned, you know, the focus of our webinar today is to talk about that risk in that landscape. So, you know, thank you all for your time and attention. We really do appreciate it. And I'll, I'll you know, hand it back over now to, to move into the Q&A. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael and Gavin, for the presentation there. Um, if anyone from the floor has got some questions, please uh, enter your questions into the uh, chat so everyone can see it. Um, I do have two questions from the floor to start with, um, Gavin and Michael. First one being uh, more of a statement. So if the bank would trace the name on the account and match the account number to the name, wouldn't most of these pretending frauds just disappear? Michael, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah of course. So we are finding that the way that it's working in the market is the banks really are quite reluctant to look into that space. We find that it requires the banks to share a lot of information between bank to bank. So it's not something that they're really you know, open to doing necessarily with it being a very competitive landscape here in Australia in that banking market. We even had, I believe it was February last year, the ACCC was trying to lobby ASIC to force the banks to do that check to protect you know, consumers and businesses. But ASIC actually did rule in favor of the banks basically um, you know, allowing them to not have to do that check. So as far as EFT payments are concerned at the moment, it is an issue that's unfortunately here to stay where the, the banks don't yeah. look at the account name at all, basically meaning the liability sits completely with you and your team to ensure that the details are correct. Um, I, I'd like to add to that, Michael. There, there's a problem called the abstraction problem. And, and what we mean by that is to check that a name matches a number confirms two things are connected, but it doesn't confirm that you are paying who you intend to pay. So a fraudster could set up a business um, with a bank account with a similar name, um, and you could, let's say, go into online banking, and let's say you use something like a pay ID, which allegedly, you know, does do that match. All that pay ID would do is confirm that the name you've entered matches the account. It doesn't connected to the very person you intend to pay. So um, fraud fraudsters, I think, will always be impersonating something. Um, and a match itself, in the absence of matching it to something like a trading name history or some sort of other uh, sort of authoritative view on what that business is as an entity, a match itself doesn't solve the whole problem. Don't know if I explained that well, but a match itself will not solve the whole problem. It will help, though. Great, thank you. So another one from uh, Shirley: What can a user do if they accidentally click on a link, and what what will it mean? Will they still be able to access email and control so, the systems? So it it really depends on what they've clicked on. If they think they've done something wrong, firstly, I'd notify someone in your IT team, management, like. Notify someone who in your organization uh, is your best, you know, understanding of who knows about those things, often IT or the person responsible there. The first thing I would always do, just as a kind of a, a simple practice, is change your login credentials to whatever you think is vulnerable. Like um, someone, uh, someone in my family thought they clicked on something. The first thing we went and did was just change our login credentials to email, bank account, just I'm talking about in our personal capacity. So as a, as a first port of call, change login credentials to important stuff if you've, thinked on, if you've clicked on uh, something you're concerned about. Um, as to what the consequences might be, just depends on what you've clicked on. It's hard to provide a singular answer to that question. But just to repeat, because people often ask us this, what do I do if I'm concerned? Change login details fast. All right, I've got a long one now, um, and I'm going to try and summarize this for you. But 
I guess with cybersecurity uh, increasing and uh, the attacks um, almost impossible to avoid, what can we do as a business to actually persuade our customers that our services are safe or make sure we've got the upper hand? Well, I, I th you know, I think there's, I think it's about if you've put in the practices and the sort of, there is some technology involved, you know, whether it's uh, identity management tools, some of these are free and cheap online, whether it's tools like ours around payment verification and vendor management, and then policies and procedures. I think it's about creating a stack of good practice and resources that you can communicate to your customers. There are obviously certifications like um, uh, ISO, you know, we're ISO 27001 certified. Um, what's the American, there's a high American standard. SOC market. 2. SOC 2, um, you know, which obviously evolved from Sylvain's Oxley all those years ago. So, like, you know, there are independent third sort of party stamps of approval. But I think in the absence of those, it's about capturing what your posture, your procedure is, where you stand, documenting it and, com and speaking to your customers about it or communicating it. Um, I think also your customers, uh, sorry, the person who asked the question, and all customers and all trading partners, there's no perfection in cybersecurity or, or payment controls. There's no perfection. If anyone ever speaks about perfection, throw them out of your boardroom. It's about enhancement, improvement, and taking, whether it's a cybersecurity stance or your controls from 80 to 85 or 90 to 95. There's no 100, and your customers need to be understanding of that. But you can document and communicate your posture across Practice, policies, procedure, and technology, I'd say, yeah. And we have a question from Deborah. What What are your thoughts around e-invoicing? Does that change the way that... Um, it, it removes one good... Sorry, sorry, Brandon, sorry to talk over. Um, good question. E-invoicing removes one aspect of the risk, which is around email, okay, to a degree. But it's also good in answering this, I'm, I'm gonna do a better explanation of what I tried to answer earlier on around the matching and if that would solve the problem. Frauds, what e-invoicing does is it eliminates the transmission of let's say emails on PDF from one organization to another, but information still has to be entered into one ERP system. And then e-invoicing in fact is the plumbing or the infrastructure that transmits it to another ERP system. If that information is entered incorrectly, the risk still exists. So what fraudsters will do is stop trying to manipulate information on invoicing. What they will try to do is get the people who do the data entry <laughs> into the ERP system to put in the wrong, the, the wrong information, but it will help because it removes sort of the email PDF component but the actual information can still be manipulated and then you've got no checking mechanism because it's just it, the the payment information is moving just almost invisibly from the supplier's ERP to the customer's accounting software ERP. And then we have a question from Robert. Um, it's about paying ransom. What's the best uh, practice around paying ransom or not paying ransom? Yeah, yeah, good question. And I know there's a lot of debate and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preface this by going, I am not a cyber security expert. We operate in the realm of payment and financial controls and digitizing those. Cyber security is a broader church, um, which I am not an expert on. However, what I will say is this, um, I think it's very hard for government or anyone to dictate what a business could do, okay? Because I know there's a prevailing view, which has lately been covered in the press, which is if you pay a ransom where you encourage cyber criminals to keep taking ransom, basically taking, data as hostage. But surely, um, surely it's got to be on a case by case basis, given the circumstances of that business. What if not paying the ransom leads to the destruction of the business? Is it fair to say ransom should not be paid? So I know it sounds like a kind of a Switzerland kind of answer, and <laughs> yeah, but I, I think it's got to be on a case by case basis, because um, what is the full cost of not paying ransom? I also want to uh, put in another comment, which is cyber criminals are commercial organizations. One might argue that if you pay them the ransom, they will return the data because they need to pr prove their own legitimacy as a, 
you know, as a commercial entity. So if they don't return the data, then how will they ever extract ransom? Um, so I know that's kind of could be contentious, but I think it's equally contentious to say someone should never pay ransom just to mandate that. <clears throat> so case by case basis. And got one from Annette around what steps should we take to secure our email account um, or what steps should we take to secure ourselves, I guess, more broadly? Um, I can't comment specifically on email because it's a very specific area. There's things like, I think it's DCOM. There are various methodologies and things you can use. I, I think I got the acronym wrong. Is it DCOM? Um, <clears throat> I'm sure if someone Googled that, they'd get the right um, protocol. It, it's a piece of software. It's a, it's a software protocol um, to improve email security. But there might be other things, and I, I can't comment on those. We lack ex I, I personally lack expertise. Other piece, people in our business know far more about that. Um, I think in terms of just keeping yourself secure, I'll go back to what I mentioned, which is there's cybersecurity, which is the province of your IT team and the whole lot of practices. Around keeping your cash secure, there's training, culture, pressure test by simulating what fraudsters might do. And if you want to get ideas for that, I would start by subscribing to a whole lot of public, freely available sources. Start with Scamwatch by the ACCC, the OAIC have information, companies like ours have information, and that'll clue you up as to how to simulate sort of scams to your finance team. And then lastly, technology. And, and you know, there are software solutions. I would have identity management piece. I would secure your email, as, as you asked. I would have a vendor management thing. I'd have a payment control thing. Those are kind of the bricks I'd put in that wall. Yeah, great. So I think, uh, uh, Gavin and uh, Michael, I guess the overall thing there is defense in depth is um, yeah. a good way to protect yourself and education if something I guess overall, if something looks suspicious, treat it as suspicious, protect yourself yes. first, and then uh, proceed cautiously. So, um, yeah, I'd like to just uh, thank both Michael and Gavin for the fantastic webinar today. It's been very good. Thank you to everyone for your participation and attendance today. Um, everyone will receive a copy of today's webinar, recording and presentation via email within 24 um, hours. And you'll also, as you exit, be directed to a feedback form. Feedback's really beneficial for CPA Australia, as well as our presenters. So we'd appreciate if you can take the time to complete this. Everyone will receive a copy of today's webinar recording and presentation via email within 24 hours. So thanks again for your time and goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.